College of Complexes will now come to order, please. The college will now come to order. Will our fellow officiantos take uh, their conversations to the cloakroom? You can tell him, Jim. All right. I'd like to wel welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim. The college consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. Then we have our speaker who will then speak up to an hour. There's a group of them tonight from the Midwest Association of from the Midwest Workers Association campaign to stop the shutoffs of utilities, gas, water, and electricity. They'll speak up to maybe about an hour or so. Then we will have a question and answer period. We ask in the question and answer period to uh, ask questions because after that we'll have our infamous rebuttal period. We have to be out of here at 9:45. I mean 8:45 because the restaurant closes at nine. Yeah, I, okay, so I got a little quick piece of business to take care of. As I'm now taking a New Year's resolution to uh, do things ahead of time, I'll just say this Shut up, Charlie. <laughs> now that that's handled, I won't have to do it the rest of the night. All right, let's get our speakers up here. I don't know your names, so as if you want to come up and introduce yourself, Let's give a rousing round of our hand for our speakers for the Midwest Workers Association campaign to stop the shutoffs of utilities, gas, water, and electricity. Come on, guys, we can do better than this. Let's welcome them up. Yeah. Hey. 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 Midwest. Hi, how are you all? Hi. All right. Sorry, let me get this thing up. There we go. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I'm Stacy Batista. Um, I'm a full-time volunteer organizer with Midwest Workers Association. I'm a cadre, um, and I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you to Charles uh, Paydock for his generous invitation. To my right. Yeah. I'm Angelia Brown. I'm a member. I am a volunteer and cadre. I am also being trained right now to handle the speaking engagement. I am uh, Trevor Martin. I'm a volunteer organizer and have been for the past year and a half, and I am also Cadre. And in the back there, I think you know him, Jonathan Barton, <laughs> member of volunteer um, with his mom, actually. Um, and I believe you all know him as a uh, regular attendant here at yeah. College Complexes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all for having us tonight. We appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk to you guys about. Um, our membership and our organization and our, our fight to stop these utility shutoffs is a part of our larger fight to end poverty. Um, I want to give a, a kind of a background about us first, since I think may, many people may not know us here. Midwest Workers Association is an all-volunteer organizing drive of some of the lowest paid workers in the Chicagoland region. And we're uniting with people from all walks of life with the goal of eliminating our poverty at the root. We started in Chicago in 1996, um, so we are now 22, working on 23 years. Um, Jonathan's going to be passing around some, some newspapers and whatnot, so you have a little bit that you can take with you. But um, we started in 1996 um, with nothing but an idea, a method, a list of names of organizers, you know, that organizers knew, their friends, their family, other people that they had met while organizing in-home care workers, temporary workers, domestic workers in different parts of the country who all had one thing, well, two things in common. One is that they didn't live wherever they were met. They lived in Chicago. And two is they said, I would love to do something, and if you ever make it to Chicago, why don't you look me up? So, you know, somewhere between 20 and one year later, we looked them up and started meeting with people and sitting down with people in the community. Um, our founding organizers had ties to Chicago. Uh, two of them, Father Bob King and uh, Bob Siegel, had grown up here you know, as young men um, and then gone elsewhere to make their careers. Um, and then uh, Claire Hebner had gone to school here but had family in the area. Um, she went to University of Chicago and, like many graduates, uh, could not find work in Chicago, uh, could not find work in her field 
anywhere, actually. Um, but she did want to do something about the problem, and so she began organizing with a group that challenged her, well, why, why not? Take up the challenge. This is not acceptable. Take up the challenge. Let's organize. Um, so they knew from talking to family and friends that there were serious problems in Chicago, that the conditions that people were facing in other parts of the country, the West Coast, the East Coast, could be found right here in a place that they knew well. And so they began to talk about the idea of possibly starting something in Chicago. And so they came back uh, in 1996 and began contacting family, friends, relatives, friends of friends, all those folks who said, I live in Chicago and would do something if you, if you guys ever make it here, started meeting with them. And, uh, you know, we had, not a, we had not a dime basically to run on, but, um, you know, that's kind of how it goes when you're organizing. But we had a method to reach others in the community. And so we started to sit down and learn what had happened in Chicago. By 1996, as I'm sure many of you are aware, how many people here are native Chicagoans, like you've been raised here? Okay, how many people have been here greater than 30 years? Okay, almost everybody in the room. Excellent. So as you guys may have seen yourselves, um, what they found was <laughs> Chicago, uh, you know, is one of the powerhouse economies in the country. Um, Currently, I believe it's about 10, number 10 measured by GDP in the world, actually. Um, yeah, we have a high poverty rate. And um, it's getting worse, it has been getting worse, as more and more the traditional industrial base that made this city, that was you know, run largely by unionized, organized working people uh, in the stockyards, steel, packing houses, all of that, started to leave the area as the corporate owners decided it would be cheaper, better for their bottom line, to just move to some place like the middle of nowhere in Georgia and set up the plant there. Where there was no union tradition, people were not organized, people were poor and desperate, and they could, they could take advantage of that. Which left a huge gaping hole in the economy. Hundreds of thousands of people have lost union paying jobs uh, in the last 30 years. Um, and at this point, you know, when, when our organizers started, it was two years after NAFTA had gone in. Everyone remembers Clinton ran on that promise of, you know, I will not put in NAFTA. Labor swung behind him. Two years later, puts in NAFTA, which proceeds to make it easy for the big businesses to get these federal tax incentives and just go across the border to Mexico where they've been exploiting people for pennies on the hour, helping to trigger successive waves of migration that to this day affect people all across the Chicago and you know, really the United States, uh, forcing poor workers across the border to try to compete with poor workers here, uh, which we see as a no-win situation for anyone except the largest corporations. So um, that was what was happening. Our early membership, a lot of them had been laid off, had lost their jobs, or had retired from jobs that were being eliminated in the factories or transformed into some kind of temporary work. Um, and so that, you know, a lot of people were on welfare, doing welfare to work programs, which never resulted in a real job. It was just, oh great, your certificate's up, you've gotten the training. Uh, by now, next batch of social service recipients was rotated in to replace them and more jobs would be jettisoned in favor of taking the social service recipient workers. So welfare to work was going in and it was kicking our people out of jobs. Um, so our membership uh, is, is very diverse. We do, our, our people do a lot of different kinds of work, but the bottom line is they perform many of the most socially necessary functions in the society. Things our communities could not function without, including things like childcare, elder care, food preparation, home health, retail, landscaping, factory work, janitorial work at any variety of institutions, including gerontological wards, etc., um, and much more. But historically, those jobs have lacked organization, which means people in those jobs, our members, have been denied any kind of control over their living and working conditions. Has anybody here worked in those kinds of jobs before? Anybody worked home health aid or landscaping, retail? Anybody done those kinds of jobs before, service work? Okay, what kind of work did you do? 
You did the what? For six months. For six months? Home health. Home health. Okay. So you know how hard that can be. It's a real it's a real labor of love, but money wise it's kinda of tight. How about you, sir? Retail. Retail work? Okay. How was it? It's hard. It was hard. It's hard. You gotta deal with the public. Yeah. Yeah, low pay. Not a lot of. And today, I mean, how can you get anyone to empty their pocket, right? It's like we had money, we we do something else with it. But a lot of our members are working those jobs, and it's increasingly part time. It's increasingly on call. Um, you know, and it's increasingly paying less than it takes to survive. Uh, everyone knows Chicago's minimum wage is twelve fifty, right? Currently. Does anyone know where that puts you in relation to the federal poverty line? Below. Below. For a family of four, that is less than the federal poverty line if you make minimum wage working full time, which is increasingly rare. Um, so right there, Chicago's minimum wage is a poverty wage. There is no two ways about that. And then you add on to that, no health insurance. Uh, no access to health care because no health insurance. No pension. IRA, Roth, blah, 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 forget about it. You don't have it. Um, so our members looking forward to the day of retirement can essentially look forward to a life of complete uncertainty, probable debt, and possible eviction. To say nothing of getting your utilities shut off, which is happening to tens of thousands of people as we speak. Uh, just this year, People's Gas got an $8 billion rate increase, which we'll be getting into more. Um, but um, they went ahead after that and shut off uh, 12,000 households, they issued 65,000 disconnection notices in two months between April and June. They are making us pay $8 billion to cover their own pipe replacement firm because they did not set money aside to replace and repair their own leaking and now dangerous gas pipes. And they got the state of Illinois to agree that that was in fact okay. That they, for their negligence, get to charge all of us extra money. And for our members, this means shut up. Um, our members are constantly in this position, getting forced to choose between very basic needs, um, like once you pay the rent, you often have to choose whether to pay the electricity, the gas, the water, if you are, you know, like renting a house or something. Um, you may have to choose whether to buy food that night. Um, medical care is usually not an option for our members, um, you know, in terms of actual decent care. Um, Yet our members help make Chicago one of the most productive and prosperous economies in the world, as mentioned. For a few people. Where's, you know, like, that's what we're dealing with. And I want to have Angelia speak a little bit about this. Uh, do you want to? Oh, hello. <coughs> I want to share with you. I want you to probably take that off. What? I didn't feel like. No, that's serious. Okay. I want to share with you that I worked on my job, uh, which was a beer distributor for 31 years. And I started out as customer service. Then I went from that to sales representative. Then I worked in the office, keeping the accounts up and uh, opening accounts, closing accounts. By the time I finished working there in that area, I was also answering the phone, troubleshooting, de delivery issues accidents and customer problems, monitoring the security, uh, letting buzzing people in, uh, and putting in orders, adjusting orders for beer. You name it. I was uh, jack of all trades. Uh, and I was working the office by myself. Uh, the company kept giving me things to do, but I wasn't getting increases with these more responsibilities. I was getting a regular 2% for cost of living increase a year. Every now and then, I got a surprise. When I started my job, my rent was a one bedroom apartment, 350. 12 years later, it was 675. My apartment didn't get no bigger. Whatever I got, it went there. Every year, electricity, gas went up. So no matter how hard I worked, I couldn't get ahead. I was like a hamster in a wheel, running as fast as I can, 
for staying in the same place. It's a real slap in the face when you can make over $100,000 over 20 years in your 401k. And by the time you decide to use it or retire, uh, which I am retired now, uh, you find out that the value of that $100,000 is pretty much what $50,000 was when you started saving. I was running through life trying to gain, but Pac-Man was always creeping up behind me to get a good bite out of it. Uh, when MWA came to my door, all this was going through my head, and I felt like I was alone. I felt like it only happened to me. <laughs> but um, here comes an organization of people that is dealing with my very problems and I was, that I was facing. And it didn't take me long to figure out that we could help each other. So I became a member. Then, then I became a volunteer and took on the coordinating the Saturday food distribution for our members. Uh, later on, I began to be trained for these speaking engagements. As I learned to organize and progress with MWA, I started to see how what was happening to me was happening to so many people. Utility rates, water bills, property taxes are eating away all of our income. When I was growing up, people in my community had decent jobs, working at factories and local businesses. Now there's not as many jobs, and most jobs are temporary or part-time paying minimum wage. Minimum wage is a joke. You can't live on it. Meanwhile, a tiny few people are making huge sums of money by paying us pennies and jacking up gas and electric, uh, electric rates and getting tax breaks from the government. It's like an old civil rights song I know that said the rich are rich because the poor are poor and brother, that ain't good. With MWA, I finally learned what I could do about the situation. Organize. The people know what we want. We people know what we want. We know what we need. We just need a way to get it. MWA gives the working people like me and, and, uh, um, and you a way to organize and fight. January 10th of 2018, I was one of the speakers at the Illinois Commerce Commission meeting. Our delegation was fighting to stop the ICC from approving people's gas, charging all of us $8 billion to replace their gas mains. $8 billion? Of course, people's gas needs to replace their mains. They need upgrading, yes. But they should be the ones paying for it. They've had years to budget for it, but they've been paying out dividends to major financial institutions like J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. I reminded the ICC that per their Public Utilities Act of 2001, their mandate is to ensure utilities are affordable and available to all. And this is their law. Uh, there were over 80,000 families living without heat when I spoke. So I was compelled to say a government that does not follow its own laws has no legitimacy in the eyes of the people. It appeared to me the state already had their minds made up to pass it. <coughs> Only one commissioner out of five voted no. But of course, he was about to retire in a week. His parting words to us were, 
that he was glad to see us there because, and I quote, if the people don't advocate for themselves, no one else is going to do it. These words came out of his mouth at this meeting. I'm organizing because I don't want what's happened to me to keep happening to other people. It's already happened to too many of us. It's happening to more and more every day. It will keep on happening to more and more of us unless we stop it. We need a solution for all of us. We have a method and a strategy for building a force capable of turning things around. What we need is to advance now is, uh, is more organizers, volunteers, and support of all kinds. And I hope you'll join us. So, um, Angelia spoke of the utility fight and the need for, like a method to turn things around. You see, it's going to take uniting the many to defeat those few, you know, these banks she was talking about, um, to do it. And in the meantime, low-income workers, those who suffer the most directly from the problem, who face problems that pe other folks don't face because they are that unstable in terms of their, you know, their capacity to survive. Um, they need to be organized and have a way that they can actually lay forward solutions that would work for them. Because if it doesn't work for them, problems still going to exist, even if it's fixed for others, right? So they need a way to organize, and we've got a way to do that. It starts with canvassing. We get out door to door in hard hit communities. Uh, we're just out there today. Trevor was out there today, um, reaching people in the streets of Inglewood. And then we have a benefits program that we work together to build and sign up. It's self help, so meaning others in the community work on it, but they work with members. And so members can learn how to organize in a way that helps bring in resources that are badly needed by their household, like emergency food, clothing preventive medical care for uninsured members, preventive dental care for uninsured members. Uh, we do legal advice of various types. We also do advocacy to get on the phone, and when somebody comes in with one of these disconnection notices or a bill that they know they can't pay, we get on the phone and we fight to stop the disconnection and get in a situation where the member has a better ability to deal with it. We just two weeks ago had to stop people's gas and whether or not unlike this, from shutting off a 64-year-old retiree and her 87-year-old mother. Yeah, and uh, we had to fight and force them to stop this, this travesty. Um, so it can be done. We've also been doing uh, more water advocacy in like three months than we've done in the past seven years. Uh, this is really part of where we're going and uh, part of why we're so happy to speak to you guys because we've, you know, we've done a lot of work fighting to end, um, you know, utility shocks. Like our history in fighting gas rate increases, for example, goes back as far as 2009 in terms of mobilizing the public. And we don't just bring, you know, like, low-income workers. Our members get out and do phone calls to reach students, professors, clergy, um, you know, professionals of various types, the small business community, all of whom are working with us in the day-to-day -to, -day to help with the benefits program, different capacities. But they can also come with us and fight. And so we'll regularly bring, you know, like a whole crew of people. Um, let me just, I can give you an example here. All right, so this is, uh, sorry, I only have, thank you, Trevor. All right, so yeah, you can see the difference, you know, so this was one of our speakers, Anthony Hunter, a young man who lives uh, down in the heart of Inglewood with his family of 10. Um, he was our Workers Benefit Council speaker, putting down the position that there should be no rate increases, all rate increases should be jettisoned and rolled back. Um, and then we had others, Celia Herrera, who spoke on behalf of her community in Spanish. Um, her daughter, Kenya, who is a college student, spoke on behalf of young people aspiring to a better life and how the, the rate increases were affecting her family's ability to deal with that. Timuel Black, um, who some of you may know, he's a member of our organizing committee, but he's been organizing um, small business keepers on the south side since the 1930s in the Great Depression. He came and spoke. Um, Angela Leon, 
Yeah. Speaking for Westside Communities, Bamboo Solzman, she's a retired respiratory therapist. Buddy Lopez here is a member of the organizing committee. But he's a small business owner down in Inglewood who keeps cars on the road. God knows how. I don't know how he manages to stay in business, but he does. But that was part of what he talked to. He's like, look, nobody's got money in their pockets. They're paying through the nose for basic cost of living. A car repair is expensive. Everybody thinks they can make the car go just a little bit longer. It's like, I as a professional look at people's cars and I think to myself, I don't want to be on the road with you people because your car's going to break. I know it. But no one can come to my shop and get it fixed. And I got seven people that are depending on me to provide work so they can pay their families. These are local men working in my shop. What are we supposed to do? Why do these but as people's gas get their repairs subsidized and you won't even like help me make sure that my car lifts stay in operation. I gotta do that myself. Why does people's gas get special treatment? You know, so he came and he spoke. So we bring a whole, you know, broad stretch of the community together to fight. But it all starts with the benefits part, because our members gotta be here and stable enough that they can fight. And that benefits program is the key to that. And it's the key to uniting throughout the year so that you know, anytime our members want to, we can fight and we can make sure that we're working together every day to deal with the poverty situation. So that's, you know, it's an important part of our work and uh, we're definitely going to need your help with the winter survival campaign, but also to help us deal with the next phase of our utility fight. Um, Angelia mentioned it, but we've been seeing a lot of water shutoffs in our neighborhoods. Has anyone seen these? They're orange. They're, you know, yeah. about this big. They get stuck on buildings. You guys seen these around? They're out there, they usually only stay up if the house is abandoned. Anyone who gets it who's living there is usually humiliated by it. Because it'll tell you exactly, like, your neighbors could come up and read how much money you owe. And they'll just rip it down. But we've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of these things all across the south end, from the southeast side up to Humboldt Park, one picture of them. But um, we've been having to stop people getting disconnected from their water. Uh, or to get back on, because one of our members was already Thank off. You. You know, imagine that, living without water. She was literally filling jugs at a friend's house and walking jugs into her home to flush the toilet or take a bath. And she'd been living like that since January when she lost her temporary job that she'd had for something like 12 years. Never made more than minimum wage. I mean, she dared to ask for a raise one too many times, pointing out that you hired somebody directly who was not as good a worker as I am and came on later. They fired her on the spot. She lost her house, they moved into a barely habitable building, and there was no water. And the city was totally content to let them live that way. We fought and got her, in, got her turned on, um, but it took minimum two weeks of fight once she came through the door. And she's just the first. There's many others, um, it's, it's, it's a growing thing. Part of what's happening here, um, everyone, is familiar with how um, the ratings agencies have been downgrading Chicago's credit. Everyone's seen that story in the newspaper, right? The city has been so giving away tax breaks to these large corporations, diverting our property taxes from schools, medical care, roads, the water infrastructure, to large corporations in the form of tax breaks, that they've blown holes in the budget, that they are borrowing to cover just the general obligations hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year from some of the largest financial institutions, including BlackRock, including, uh, I think it's PNC, uh, there's one other one, JP Morgan. Um, so they've been borrowing money to cover basic things that they you know, normally would just give taxes for. But they're not using it for that. They're subsidizing corporate profits. So of course Moody's and them come along and go, gee, you're giving away money. You're not creating any new jobs or tax base that actually has you know, some real robustness and depth to it. Everybody's a temp worker. Nobody can really pay the taxes. So uh, every time you borrow, that's like another black mark against you. And we're going to downgrade you. So now if they want to borrow against those same assets, you're going to pay a hefty, hefty interest fee. Hefty. So what did they do? Did they give us living wage jobs? Did they stop the corporate welfare? No. What they did was they looked at what assets they owned that they wholly controlled that they hadn't borrowed against yet, in which they thought, gee, no one's going to not pay this, right? And what was the bill that they realized fit those categories? Water. 
Exactly. Water is wholly controlled by the city. They, they are allowed to use it as a revenue generator, and that's what they're doing. The rates are up 300% since 2008. They just tapped on a 29.5% rate increase, allegedly to cover the teacher pensions or some, you know, some form of pension. Is that illegal? That's what they, no, it's not. It is not illegal. Actually, wait, get this, get this. Okay, here's the good part. Pensions, right? Why is there no money in the pension fund? Because they both gave it. Huh? The state legislature gave us a holiday from 1996 to I don't know when. Yeah. It's a nice way of saying it's actually the state law that although when pensions are due, they have to pay you, but they are not obligated to pay into the pension fund until bankruptcy is imminent. That's the law. So they just had a pension holiday for themselves, i.e. they didn't pay their bill. They just stopped paying it for, for 10 years. If, if our members stop paying the water bill for 10 years, you know what happens to them? Shut off, usually like shorter than that period of time. Or if you stop paying your rent for two months, you're out. But they gave themselves a pension holiday, they did not pay the pensions, and now they're saying we got to make up for their decisions. They're prioritizing corporate profits. So they're borrowing against our water, they're tacking on taxes and fees and et cetera to our water bills. We're seeing shutoffs block by block in all kinds of poor neighborhoods from as far north as Humboldt Park, Lawndale, Southeast Side, Inglewood's huge, Roseland, it's all over. Nobody's challenging this. Most people think you can't be shut off from water. Well, I'm here to tell you, because I've been one of the main water advocates, you can be shut off from water. There is no medical protection, i.e. if you're sick, we had a cancer patient who was holding a termination notice, they said there's no provision for medical need. And the Citizens Utility Board told us there is not one organization in the state of Illinois that they know of that has any provision for water. So like if you run out, of, you can call, they probably won't give it to you. So this is what we're facing. Our members have decided enough of fighting one by one by one. We got to do with water what we've done with gas because we've been successful in cutting over a billion dollars of rate increases for people's gas. It's hard work, but we can do it. And what choice do we have? It's water. It's the thing that no one can live without. And if we let them do this, you know, hey, uh, there's third world countries that have better water access than we do at this point in the game. So I think on that one for a minute. But um, it's only because people fought for it. It is only because people fought for it. If we don't fight for it, as this alderman said, nobody else is. They're on the gravy train. <laughs> you know? So we've got a deal, and I want to have... Um, I want to have Jonathan. Jonathan, have you passed out newspapers to everybody? Jonathan's going to pass out some literature so you have our contact information. And then. This one, this was outside of a bus. Oh, this was down, this was right here. This was actually inside the Illinois Commerce Commission downtown at 10 30 in the morning on a Wednesday morning. That's the only time they hold meetings. So, I'm going to have Trevor speak about the need for volunteers. Years, and then um, I'll do one last explanation of some of the stuff, and then you know we'll we'll open it up. Yeah, yeah we're gonna just finish it out, and then yeah, Trevor, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having us. Uh, I want to close by uh, talking to y'all about an opportunity we are offering at MWA. During the 1950s and 1960s, hundreds of thousands of students, mothers, fathers, clergy, and others dropped what they were doing to join the civil rights movement in uh, whatever way they could for whatever time they could. Now, this is how we got Mississippi Summer and Freedom Summer, and an end to, um, yeah, uh, Congress was forced to enact a Civil Rights Act and a Voting Rights Act and the nominal War on Poverty. 
And this year, 2018, marks the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign, an ambitious undertaking spearheaded by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. As Dr. King himself pointed out, the goal of the campaign was to eliminate poverty. In his last speech, made April 3rd, 1968, Dr. King made this announcement. And another reason I'm happy to live in this period is that we have been forced to a point where we are going to have to grapple with the problems that men have been trying to grapple with through history. But the demands didn't force them to do it. Survival demands that we grapple with them. No. Now, without arguing over the degree of success of the prior efforts, poverty was not eliminated, and MWA has been dealing with the question of poverty for over 22 years. The fights we've engaged in that Stacy and Angelia spoke about, and our benefit program that enables people to survive in order to fight for an end to poverty, are all part of a steadily growing movement that started with a simple idea shared by a handful of organizers. Dr. King was assassinated before he could see the goals of the Four People's Campaign fulfilled, but this call to grapple with these age-old problems is the call we picked up and the goal for which we have been fighting for since our doors opened over 22 years ago. As I have described briefly today, we have accomplished much, but there is still much more to do. And we live in times between where the stark contrast between the decent living we could all have and the miserable conditions faced by tens of millions of the poorest workers in this country is moving more and more people to decide that they must put their concerns into action. I hope our words today have brought some of you to see how you can do this with us. The problem of poverty is so pervasive in the world that in September of 2015, all 193 member nations of the United Nations adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, also known as the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. If you look at page three of our newspaper, we have them printed inside with goal number one, to be an end to poverty in all forms everywhere by the year 2030. There has been a silence in the US media and by the US government ever since these goals were adopted and poverty in the US has only increased as we have described here today. We're at a point in our city's history where the city is methodically shutting people off from water while insulating itself from affected or concerned residents the, uh, to, better in, uh, to ensure that they can pursue without interruption their strategy of increasing water rates to cover up the gaping budgetary holes the city's corporate welfare programs have created even at the cost of mass shutoffs to this vital resource. Dr. King knew it would take more than marches, though, to eliminate poverty, and so do we. Today we have described our day-to-day -day work uniting our low-income membership through our benefit program and joining with allies from the business community, academics and students, the religious community, laying the basis to fight and win against policies like utility rate hikes and mass utility shutoffs, whereby the state violates its own law that utilities be affordable and available to all. But none of this can happen without you. We are entirely volunteer run. Yeah, uh, people uh, have a free weekend uh, or anything like that or a free off day um, and I encourage you to come and speak to us afterwards um, and uh, learn how you can aid uh, on those on behalf of the lowest paid workers in Cook County. No experience is necessary and we train on the job and newer volunteers work with more experienced volunteers to learn valuable organizing skills. We have full and part-time positions available. It's a great opportunity that works in many ways. You will provide immense aid to the poorest working people in our area, joining a fight to end poverty at its root. 
and while you experience a priceless organizing experience, learning as you work. We're doing an introductory and orientation and a day of organizing on Saturday, next Saturday, back the 5th, where we will be going door to door in one of our low income membership neighborhoods on the next canvas, like we have talked about, to find the people who are a critical need, as well as those who can join the fight. It starts at 9 at our office at 5152 South Halstead Street. Next Canvas is very important because with the city going block by block, posting water termination notices, we have to extend the lifeline to residents facing water shutoffs and organize our communities to fight. Our members are currently developing a petition drive against water shutoffs to help bring people of all walks of life together. Now, there is no other recourse for residents, and working people are not interested in yet another aid program that just ensures the city can force the rest of us to bear the cost of their own rate hike strategy. But to stop these policies, poor workers have to organize to hold government accountable to their own interests. Otherwise, low-income workers will continue to suffer from the organized wealthy interests and the disorganization of those who care about ending the injustice of poverty. Now, Jonathan and Angelia um, will be circulating the clipboards now. If you can come this Saturday, please take a minute to put your name and phone number down, and we'll tell you more about it. If you can't come Saturday, please put a good time to call you down. Uh, when we can call you about other times, you can come and learn more about what we do. Please make sure to leave a phone number, because that is a primary way we communicate real human beings talking to each other. If you're interested in full-time organizing uh, over the uh, any free time you've got and want to find out what is involved with that, leave a note about that next to your name as well. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to Stacy now. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. One last way people can help, we may call in any ways available, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. One last way people can help if they are interested is we are 100% volunteer. What that means is there's no paychecks at all in our organization. I'll say it again. No paychecks at all in our organization. We also refuse on principle to take government money. If you take their money, they will not let you fight their own policies. So we have to be independent here. Uh, we also do not accept funds that have strings attached. Our members need to be able to fight for what they want to fight for, when they want to fight it, at any time. So we have to stay independent. That does mean that we have to cover certain basic costs. Uh, right now it's winter, so our office being open seven days a week, nine to nine, every day, including New Year's, Christmas, and other holidays, is a warming center. And we've got to pay the people gas bill there, which is ridiculously high at this time of year. But it's necessary. People can come in there. We just reached somebody, uh, one of our members was doing phoning this afternoon, and reached somebody who called back in and said, I don't have enough food in my house tonight. Are you open? And we're like, yeah, come on down. So we have to be there, but we got to have a functional, warm office that members can safely and comfortably work in. We have the opportunity for people to donate if they should so desire. We have a beautiful calendar that speaks to a lot of the work that we're doing here and is part of a growing nationwide movement. With our analysis of like, how do we even get into this situation? And what are we going to do to get out of it? And all artists are volunteers as well. These are some of the top illustrators who donated original artwork to illustrate different facets of the struggle. This is a suggested $20 donation towards the gas bill, but whatever you can do, if you are so moved, it's a help. If you really want a calendar, come talk to me afterwards. we got calendars that you can donate for. Otherwise, if you want to put something in the can, you can. It's up to you and your discretion. And I'm going to turn it over now for questions to the audience. And thank you so much for having us again. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, who wants to take questions? Andy, you going to moderate or not? Is there a mediator? Yeah, is there a moderator? Uh, just uh, call them and we'll... we'll okay, let's uh, just, just call on people. Just call on people?
Go ahead. Okay. Um, let me, the young lady here had, had a question earlier. I think she was the first one to have a question. So I want to talk. Did you have a question? Well, I just was part of it. Okay. This is what I just believe it's the same thing. This is the they, they make sure that they don't tell anyone about it, right? <laughs> Large media doesn't well, talk about it. Well, why is it so bad? Why is it so Well, we're fighting against some of the most powerful interests. Right, like you think about it, who owns the media? Who's got, anyone know who the largest, owner of the largest me, media retailer is? <laughs> Jeff Bezos, Amazon, Mark Zuckerberg is another. These guys are trying to pay their people about three cents a word, with an average article length of about 300 words. What interest do they have to learn that low-income workers are fighting to turn it around? So that's that's part of the story. Is they're not going to cover us very much. I, I thought everyone was on speak louder. I thought everyone was on an even kill. Well. I know that's what they say, but I gotta leave it to you to, to decide if what you've heard makes sense. How even is that feel? How even is that feel? You know? That's why we need you. If you're impressed by what you just heard, you could really make a difference driving it forward. You really could. I hope you'll you'll give you'll give us an opportunity to contact you. Great. Uh, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing, but I'm sure you're very aware that it's not new. I'm sure you've heard of Salalinsky. I'm sure you've heard of SEIU, Service Employees International Union, that just gave a uh, million dollars to a candidate for a uh, mayor, mm -hmm. so are you in touch with SEIU? Ask me, mm -hmm. One North Side, Jane Addams Senior yeah. Caucus, or many other organizations? The answer is it depends on the organization. We do have contacts with SEIU. Just for the record, we are a labor organization, but we organize people that government recognized unions under the National Labor Relations Act cannot reach legally. Like our members are forbidden from joining those unions. So we do have contacts. It kind of depends on the organization. I know I've met a couple of Jane Addams people, but haven't. I, I know you guys have been busy too, so we haven't really connected. But we would be like happy if anyone's part of a group that they think should hear about this. I'll be back. Here. Might might want to do something with us. I encourage you. There's a line on the the sign up sheet that says contacts. Sheet that would be the one. Like fill it out. Like I'm part of whatever you're part of, and then depending on the organization, like maybe you can help us get an introduction, come on down, volunteer, take the word back, and let them know, you know, because we would be happy to sit down with somebody. Like, you know, you Thank you. No problem. Uh, I really have three questions. Oh, boy. One, does the water company have a competing entity? Does the electric company have any competition? Does the gas company have any competition? Okay. Is that the three okay. questions or is that one question? That's the three questions. Okay. The answer to all your questions is no. The gas and electric are private, for-profit, state-sanctioned monopolies. The city water department is the city water department, i.e. it's a publicly owned thing. But the city is enabled to, to generate, use it as a revenue generator. And as, as noted, they've created a shambles for working people's economy, and therefore this is what they're doing. But no, there is not competition, although, note it well, people. Um, there was recently an article in the Tribune, like earlier this, not the Tribune, I'm sorry. Um, so, thank you, I'm like the other paper too. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, brain, brain froze. Um, in which they spoke of an attempt by Goldman Sachs to buy our water source. Now, they were rebuffed, allegedly, but they won't let us see the de details of the author because they say it's proprietary information. And as you may know, our dear and outgoing governor has just, uh, I believe, passed a law that says it makes it easier to buy municipal water sources. So if Goldman Sachs was interested before, I can't imagine that they and others aren't seeing the potential here. And effectively, in my, my opinion, um, 
When you've got a group of banks, like U.S. Bancorp, BMO, PNC, finance groups, this is who owns a large chunk of the debt on the water. When they own the debt, they basically control the water source already. Whether, it's pri whether they say it's privately funded or not, it's uh, city's going to pay them first. So, yeah, the, the answer to your question is currently no. There is no competition um, for people's gas and com ed. Um, not if, like if you want gas and electricity delivered to your home, you have to oh, have a bill. With it. You can get an alternative supplier, which may or may not promise you something that turns out to be true in the end. But you still have to have people's gas to come in to actually get the, the electricity or the gas actually. Isn't that why they're so expensive? Um, not necessarily. The reason they're expensive is that they are a for profit entity, so I, what's their interest is to make money off of it. And uh, they're making a lot of money off of it. And the thing is, the state's responsibility is to prevent price gouging. That was the whole idea. Like, it will be okay to have for-profit monopolies in charge of vital resources if and only if the state regulates it to avoid price gouging. Well, when the state approves rate increase after rate increase after rate increase, billions of dollars, and just, you know, every year, practically. Here's another one. Where's the protection? The way the fees, you say? They're raising it every year? A lot of pretty, pretty nearly. Yeah. But what percentage? Depends on the year. Depends on the year. All right. <laughs> there, was, there was a time when our... We're going to go around the room. There was a time when our utilities were regulated. Um, you know, like AT&T and uh, all the rest of them. And then somebody came along and said, oh, everything should be a free enterprise, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And now we have this mess. <laughs> And it doesn't work. Correct. So, so what can we do to go back and regulate all the utilities? Yeah. Well, here's the thing that I that this is why we're doing what we're doing. We see that for the government to actually respond to the interests of the people, because you know a corporation is going to do what a corporation is going to do. What do they do? They make money, lots of money. That's what they're kind of set up to do. But they can only do that at our expense if we got a government that says that's okay. So the question is, how are we going to force them to deal with us rather than them on a consistent basis? And we see that there is no precedent for that if the society is not organized. If working people who make those resources available do not organize to ensure that they actually are available and that the government will actually respond to that. And that has to start with the bottom because there have been many examples of organizations that started somewhere else and got a solution for that chunk of the population while our members were still in a position to get shut up. So that's why we start at the bottom in the poorest communities like Inglewood and stuff. But that's we see as a prerequisite for any kind of significant change. Why, why don't you create some competition? You know, get off the grid. I mean, the Amish did it, mm -hmm. you know, and they're surviving quite well. So why don't you train your people to just say, you know, we're not going to be a part of this anymore. and 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 stop uh, dealing with scraps. You know, just get off the grid. Well, and uh, yeah, yeah well, I we mean, got a whole lake over there. You know, there's the question of how you get it. I mean, I certainly talked about our member who was letting water jugs through home. She's not a well person, so there's the question of how you would deliver it. We see it's. Yeah, you could go off the grid, you could try. I know from talking to people that that's a difficult proposition when you live in an old building whose roof is not up to code necessarily, or at least not up to code for those kinds of things. It is actually, it costs money. And it's, right now our members don't even have money for food and rent half the time. And that's gonna be their first priority. So what we see is to make it viable, to truly get an, a solution that works, is it would be great if we could all stop the carbon. Cetera, but, you know, there's a lot of reasons to do it, right? Like, so many reasons. But right now, it is very difficult for low-income members to deal with that. And it, it doesn't really solve the fundamental question of, so how would the government allow Edison Electric, which is one of the largest um, lobbyists in Washington, which is currently working with the Hope Brothers to screw with solar? Like, how, how, does, how does just getting off the grid deal at all with their ability to put in policies that can take your land, that can you get you, you know, enough money to change the system? So the only solution is to just we see, huh. cut it off. We see the only our solution is organizations sufficient 
to deal with the problems. You're only going to catch the people who need it. The people who are marginal are going to pay it because they don't care. The, mil the What's left of the middle class are going to continue to pay their bill every month because it doesn't sure. make any difference. And, well, we, and, and yeah. without the middle class, you can't get anything changed. Well, it, that's the thing. We're all working people at the end of the day. Without us, the middle class is going to experience uh, if we don't have water, our members are going to be the ones who are washing people in hospitals and in your own home without sufficient sanitation in theirs. Epidemics of hepatitis A. We've actually seen this in other, in other cities. We, be, we depend on each other. Without you, we can't rise. Without us, you're going to be dragged down. It's, it's up to us to overcome that division, come together. Unfortunately, we see more people are willing to work for it than ever before. It is harder. But we have to fight for a solution for all of us, and that's what we're about. Uh, Tim, no, no, I don't want to come out. Um, thank you so much for the program. Louder, it's very, please. Very interesting. So my question is, can you give me an example or prove, like, whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. right, it's help. Okay. Like, real help. Sure. What is only, like, uh, um, advertising and fl flyers. I would like to know if you had results, really, like, helping like, the deal for the water, for gas, mm -hmm. for kids, whatever. Well, Give me an example. Certainly, um, on the individual level, for one example, uh, as I mentioned, we had a member who had no water in her home because she lost her job, moved into a barely habitable building, she only spoke Spanish. Um, the city had, the city knew she was not getting the water bills that were piling up at a different address. They knew that, but they didn't actually attempt to reach out to her. Their excuse being, we're an out, we're an income call center. We don't do outbound call. They, they wouldn't bother to check because they wouldn't bother to check. Anyhow, um, they knew something was wrong, but they didn't deal with it. And so we reached her on the canvas. We knocked on her door. This is a 90 degree day. And she had a little granddaughter playing a tub of water out front, which a neighbor had filled for her. We started talking about the situation and asking if she'd seen these orange shutoffs. She's like, actually, I have this problem. I'm shut off right now. My neighbor filled this up, but. I don't have water. We said, okay, why don't you come into the office? Why don't you come in? We have a regular advocacy session every Tuesday. Come in and let's try to deal with this. We'll get somebody who can speak Spanish. It took some pursuit because, frankly, she was convinced that no one was really going to help her, that, you know, nice people are nice people, but what can you do? We finally got her in. And it took us two weeks of calls and fights, but we got her water turned on. We got her water tested by a volunteer uh, plumber that we know who, you know, as able, because something was wrong with the pipes, and it, there was like a piece missing as well. Like this house is pretty, dis like it's, it's had problems. But anyhow, there was a piece missing that would not allow the water to flow properly. So it was just like when it was on, it would flood and turn off again. Terrified to talk to the city, because if the city sees that, they're going to say building code violation. She doesn't have money for building codes. So let's organize a volunteer plumber to come check it out and deal with it. So they went, they checked, they fixed. City turned the water on. She's fine. So how long it was all together? Like About two weeks of fighting from the day she got through the door to the day we got all the water on and it was flowing and it wasn't leaking out, you know. Yeah. Now that's one story. There are many others like it. On the more collective front, um, we were uh, instrumental in stopping a one billion dollar rate increase for people's gas in 2017. Um, we mobilized, our members mobilized three different times, January, February, March, against a rate increase we knew was coming. Um, they weren't putting it on the, you know, they only put the agenda out about 48 hours before the meeting. And then you got a fax and a request to speak. How many of you can tell from four, 20, within 48 hours, and you have to have 24 hours in advance, so you've really got about 24 hours to decide to put in this thing and ask them if you can speak, unless you just decided to go in it, you know what I mean? Red. So we were looking for this and we decided to just, we're going to go. If it's not on the agenda, we're going to put it on the agenda by dint of us being there and demanding that they listen to us. So we mobilized about 24 people to go down and it wasn't on the agenda, so we fought. And you know we forced them to listen to our speakers and we cut them off after they tried to cut us off. You know, there's a whole range of tactics you got to do to get them to like actually let people talk, you know. But we got through it. It wasn't on the agenda, so we went back to the Workers' Benefit Council, which is the regular meeting for members, and they said, 
uh, okay, well, it wasn't on the agenda, so we're going back again. So we're back next month. And we spoke. And there were other groups there, like a couple other groups. Most of them, after they heard our speaker, said what they said, essentially. Like, that's what we're talking about. That sounds good. So, like, a lot of people agree with our position. No rate increase, roll the rates back, reconnect everyone who's disconnected from any ability to pay. Fix your own pipes on your dime. Um, a lot of people agree with that. It wasn't on the agenda. <laughs> so, so we're like, okay, we're going back again. And this time when we got there, they had changed the order of address to say, motion to reopen this case out of cost concerns. And they backed off. They didn't give the rate increase. Steve Daniels, a Crane Chicago business, who's one of the best utility reporters and often the only utility reporter out there with actual data, uh, was at that meeting and told us afterwards, he's like, you guys must have really shaken them because this was a done deal. This was a done deal. So, you know, we can put that to our credit. Plus, there's tens of thousands of other, hundreds, actually hundreds of billions of other dollars that we have blocked in partial, you know, reductions of rate increases. So, and then there's just the daily work that we do day to day, you know. So there's many, many ways. I guess uh, my question is, uh, do you know anything about the Gary, Indiana water that was sold to American Water, I think, maybe 10 years ago, maybe less? You know, I don't personally, but it sounds like a story we would like to hear about. Do you? No? I don't okay. know it, no, but I know that the, their okay. water was sold to, I think, American Water. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm wondering, I mean, how Gary, Indiana is a smaller Indiana yeah. town maybe 80,000 population yeah. now. So Chicago is a lot bigger. I mean, but has, have there, has there been any other city in America the size of Chicago that sold their water? That sold their water? That sold their water? Well, San, yeah, it's a nationwide yeah. trend. Like, I know San Diego sold it to the side, and I believe. There's other, there's other places. Nestle's making bids. As you, as you may remember, right? Like, I believe, wasn't it Nestle that bought some of the river water or, like, has control of the source that, that was part of the whole story of Detroit? Uh, yeah. 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 So it's a trend. It's, it's increasing. Guys, I can't hear the speaker. I can't hear the questions. That he's been a community organizer for about 10 years, organizing people with disabilities and likes what we're doing, thinks it's the correct way to do it. Because he's seen himself that in his experience, you need allies. Some of your best allies are people not facing the problems, but you got to have the people facing the problems. And that we agree absolutely 100% on that. And it's a question of how we can come together. So, yeah, no, thank you for your comment. I have another question. It kind of depends on the company. We have some corporate, again, we will not take money that has strings attached. So if it's a free and willing, like, yes, take it, do it to do your program. We're not putting any restrictions on it. Free donation, we're not asking anything in return then that's fine. It's just, and, and some companies do do that, but it's not most of them just because most of them see 
that at the end of the day, they like how things are going currently because they're making a lot of money. So it, it really depends, and it depends on how much work you do to reach those who, you know, may think that way and want to use some of their, you know, some of what they've gained to go back to working people. It just depends. Uh, uh, what, what about the Citizens Utility Board? Are they doing what they can? Um, I can't really speak to them in the specific, only in as much as, like, they have a very different strategy. We do have contacts with them that are friendly, like, you know, they just, they pursue it through legal. Um, what we've seen is that that by itself is not sufficient. Um, but that's, you know, they certainly, on some of our advocacy cases, like, we certainly asked them for, you know, their input and expertise. And uh, we interviewed one of their senior rate counselors one year to get, you know, kind of a sense of what they were seeing from, you know, channels of access that we just don't have access to. Uh, and so we were able to learn a little bit from them. So I don't really know what their specific program is right now. So I couldn't, I couldn't really speak to you on that level. Um, I asked some bottle of water recently that tasted really bad. I read the label, the five print, it was from Indiana. Mm. Why was it from Indiana? We have Lake Michigan right there. Yeah. It, it is bottled, like there is a lake right there. They can bottle the water in the area. But the water in my building is not good. That's a problem. Well, like I said, we do. In Lyons, Illinois? How far is it from here? It's like an hour away from here. Like I said, if anyone sees the need for utility advocacy, I mean, we're open. Anyone can join us as a member and apply for utility advocacy assistance. But the New, New Orleans for Chicago. Mm, we are, we are based in Chicago, but we have members who have been forced so far out, you know, by just the gentrification. They live in other, other counties. One of them was living in Gary, Indiana, actually. We don't cut people off because of that. If we're the only ones who can fight and you can get to us, we'll fight. You mentioned Cook County. You do all of Cook County? I'm an advocate for Cook County. Okay. I'm on board. Excellent. So we hope you, I hope you'll come and join us and help us to extend our reach to people. Do you have diarrhea in the mouth? Depends. <laughs> Depends on what our members want to do. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But yeah, it takes a lot of work to pull one of those off, so anyone who wants to see more of that, All right. in here. I'd like to specifically ask, and you've seen the problems, what is it as far as like governmental regulation, um, it, just what do you think, if you were like the governor or maybe a you could want to get certain regulations changed? What would they be and why? Well, let me let me take a step back slightly to recast that. Um, okay. There's a lot. Our our, ben, our organization has a 12 point ben, 11 point benefit program with a 12 for um, the people who are trying to organize like new resources. You know, but it's food, clothing, preventive medical care, dental, legal, uh, child care for you know people. Um, a media that actually gives you information as opposed to the other thing. Um, financial advocacy. Um, I can tell you in seven years organizing, five of them full time. I would say about 100% of members ask that exact question, like what would you do with the resources, like what would you put in? They say, I would put in a policy whereby we put people in homes who don't have homes, give them jobs to maintain the homes in the neighborhood, and that way everyone will have a home, everyone will have a decent paying job, and we can help you can help ourselves. That's like a hundred percent almost. Okay. And the thing is, it's not any one regulation, it's a question of who has the power to set the agenda and, and push it through and hold it in place. Because we've seen a lot of laws, like the citizen, like the, the, the mandate of the government right now, ensure that the regulation, you know, regulate so as to ensure that uh, the okay. rates on utilities are affordable and available to all. I have no disagreement with that. Right. Are they enforcing it? Not at all. It's a question of who sets the agenda and then who gets to enforce it. And if it's not us as poor working people with our allies, you know, from throughout the community and throughout the broad region, it's somebody else. And it's usually the guy who gets 11 months behind closed doors as a utility company 
right. that can afford that. So that's what I would see. Like our members need the power to set the agenda. As an addendum, can you give us maybe a little personal organization of yourself and why you got involved and what keeps you going? Uh, you want all of us to? If you don't mind. Okay. You should start. Right. You know, and it's it's just it's just it always helps just to hear a little bit about your personal back. I'm not asking that you give your life story, just a sure. little bit about why you're doing what you're doing and what the service. I know you talked a little bit about earlier about your own story with the company and you're laid off and costs are getting out of control and stuff, but please well, go that's ahead. Well, as long as I was with the company. I've had good jobs in my lifetime, I really have. Uh, I graduated from Jones Commercial High School. I worked since I was 16 years old. Um, I worked throughout high school because my mom was doing everything on her own in the house with six kids. And um, my part-time job paid for my school supplies and my clothes. Um, and I just always needed a job. I was among my friends. I was always the one with the money. And I worked for the Tribune, Chicago Tribune, as a, in um, um, classified advertising. I typed ads, legal notices. I read a lot of legal notices, and most people, if they don't read the legal notices, they won't know what street they're working on next. I know in the legal notices, you learned a lot of stuff. Well, most people, if you tell them to read the whole newspaper, they only read what excites them about the newspaper, but there's a lot of stuff in the newspaper you should know. And I learned that from working there. I worked for um, Zenith. I worked at the corporate office while the engineers were. And I saw new stuff getting made. I saw how machines work, how they can fix a TV just by heating something up in a chassis. <laughs> Uh, I've experienced a lot of things. I've, I've spent time at DeVry. I was a uh, vocalist most of my life. I um, sing, did shows, talent shows. But my main support was always a nine to five. Okay, and um, I've done studio work. I've worked with people. I spent two years at the Chicago Conservatory of Music as a voice major. So I've had a good history, but I went through all these years looking at problems. You know, watching people fall, fail, or get in trouble for trying too hard of what they call, um, uh, what they call uh, quick money. Mm -hmm. Try to go into business for themselves, or do you know, like a, be an exterminator, or, or something, you know, and fail doing that. And all the time, it's like whenever they lose a, a leg, they something comes along and knock the other one out. You know, it's like having a snowball chance in hell. You know, so I'm sick of it. I'm just sick of it. And if whatever I can do to help make this change or to help inspire people that it takes us to make this change is not going to fall in our lap. You know, whatever I can do to help people see that, you know, and encourage them not to be scared, you know, uh, then I got to work on it. And I'm learning as I'm with. MWA. It's a lot of stuff I didn't know until I started, until I became a member. You know, and you, they, they kind of tell, show you where to focus, what to listen to, what to read in the newspaper. We keep up with everything. We actually keep up with everything coming our way. Things people don't know, probably won't know till next month, we already know. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Let's. Yeah. Th this. Uh, Charlie. Let's let the let let them answer mine first. Then we'll get to yours. She's the three of them are going. Charlie. All right. <laughs>
I'll keep this one short so we can get back to the questions. Uh, I'm Trevor Martin. Um, I have been volunteering uh, again for the past year and a half. And uh, last summer, uh, the summer of 2017, I was just volunteering every now and then. Wasn't very um, political most of my life. I'm 21. Um, and didn't really grow up knowing much about politics and problems people were facing, but uh, very quickly uh, became aware that there were problems and uh, organizers uh, doing this, this kind of work were people that showed me that, you know, there aren't just problems out there, there are solutions and there are solutions we can do. So I was finishing up my studies at community college uh, I graduated, and around that time, uh, we were having the 21st anniversary dinner here at MWA um, down in, what was that, Pilsen? Yeah. That was in Pilsen um, at a local church that donated their space, mm -hmm. and that night was the, uh, when I got word of what had happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, okay. uh, when, where some of my friends were hurt, where someone was killed by a car. And I remember that I texted uh, everybody I knew saying that I was going to spend my life fighting these kind of things because it unfortunately has been life and death <coughs> for uh, too many people. Um, and so it was time for me to put something on the line and help get other young people involved. Okay. And now our please. So um, I was. I started really thinking about the problems in society. Um, my, I come from a family of teachers and engineers, so. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I was in graduate school, and uh, or I was thinking about going to graduate school, and uh, was working a temp job because guess what? You can't get a job with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. Um, I was working a temp job at the X-ray file clerk in uh, Duarte, California, and I came downstairs, and my dad said, "I don't think you're going to work." And I said, "Oh, why?" He's like. I looked at the television, so it was building on fire. I'm like, oh, that's terrible. And I saw a plane fly, and I was like, oh, that's really bad. And it was at that point that the news actually announced it was a terrorist attack. And I said, oh. And I went to work because I figured, you know, um, the world doesn't stop because of this stuff. It hasn't stopped all around the world. There's hundreds of countries that are subjected to terrorism. People got to go to work every day dodging bomb shells. Right. It's finally hit the U.S. It's finally time for us to figure out what on earth we're doing to create this problem, and we're going to fix it. So I went to work and uh, did my job. I thought this was, you know, it was important to do. You don't stop because of an attack. But then I saw our country decide to invade Afghanistan off of the most flimsy pretext of. I couldn't even figure out the legality. I was like, so if somebody in our country was part of a terrorist group that wasn't part of the government, or maybe was only tangentially related to a figure in the government, but in any case, the government didn't do it, uh, does that give a country the right to come in here and attack our country? No, it does not. So why are we doing this again? And then when it morphed to Iraq, when it was obvious that that was like completely just a, a line of uh, total distraction and an excuse to go in and, and grab some oil, I started to realize just how deep the problem went, and I didn't know what to do about it, but I quickly came to the conclusion that whatever we had in place already, by way of trying to help the poorest, hold the powerful in check, it was not working, like not at all. We were just getting rained. Like we were just, we were getting, we were getting every day. I went to protests, I saw nothing come of them, I'm like, this is, what we're doing is not working. We need something that has staying power, we need to deal. And I never saw anyone ask me to do anything that actually dealt with the lives of the poorest, not just out of pity, but out of the conviction that we could actually work together to actually end this situation for all of us until I'm at MWA at my campus. Okay. So I began volunteering. Uh, I was at that point finishing my, my doctorate. Um, I tried for two years to try to get a job in my field no, can't do it. And uh, in the meantime, I was seeing my students get crushed by debt. I was having to sign students back in every Thursday at one college who just couldn't afford it because they couldn't afford it. And here they're telling me, oh, you're, you're doing such a great job. You're doing such a great But we need dedicated employees, not a pay raise for you. Meanwhile, they're jacking the tuition rates up. And I'm like, you're hurting my students. You're hurting me. You're hurting my colleagues. I personally know PhDs who didn't know how they were going to spend grocery money this month because they lost class. Um, none of this is helping. 
what am I doing here? And then the health care thing came in, Affordable Care Act. I was one of the ones that they were going to cut my hours so that they wouldn't have to offer me health care. And I could see plainly the administration had the long game. All they had to do was wait us out, hire a new crop of adjuncts, it was over. They could afford to wait us out and put this thing in, cut our hours, and leave us high and dry. And there was nothing we could do about it, at least as professors on our campuses. But I had come to understand that those policies go along with the policies of munition companies, go along with the policies of the oil companies. They want the money. And they're going after the most things that we need. They're going after the things that make the most money, guns and oil. And they're passing the cost, all the cost, on to us. And I could stand there and let that happen. And I could see my students go down, my colleagues go down, potentially members of my family go down. I could see the people that I had personally done water, electricity, utility advocacy for, that I had come to care about through Midwest workers. I could see that their lives were just going to get worse and worse. And nothing I was doing at the pulpit was doing any kind of good. So there came a point where I decided to try full-time organizing for a month and decide that, that was really my life's path. Within two weeks, I knew I wasn't going back to the classroom. And that's why I'm doing this. Okay. Um, thanks. Charlie, you had a question? Yeah, MWA, looking through your literature, you use a lot of the phraseology of the organized labor movement. Mm -hmm. Don't mourn organize, that's Mother Jones. You got oh, those things, which side are you on, boys? That's a union song. Yep. From the coal miners. But are you organizing a union anywhere? We are not only because of, uh, I mentioned this briefly. You do everything that looks like the union. Yeah. But uh, you don't. Yeah, we're not taking that official status. The reason being that unions are controlled by the federal government under the National Labor Relations Act, which explicitly excludes domestic workers, farm workers, and anyone who's not an employee of an employer, i.e., you don't have a nine to five directly hired by your employee. I mean, your, sorry, your employer. That's most jobs these days, temp work, contract work, on-call, part-time, seasonal. If we took the status under the law that says you're officially a union, we couldn't actually organize any of our members. So it's not because we don't think, you know, like, we have nothing but, you know, praises to sing about unions that are actually fighting, but we understand that they've been, they've been put in a box away from our members and on top of that the federal government put in these very restrictive laws about what they can and cannot do once they decide to do something most of the tactics that actually work to build strong fighting organizations actually won like a twenty dollar an hour wage that used to be the middle class those are illegal for those unions to run and that's why they don't run them anymore our members could run them if they wanted to it's a question of who's going to step forward to do the organizing work to make any of that kind of thing possible. Because it is a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. But we, we prefer to stay out from under the laws of the government so that we don't owe them anything. When we fight, we fight what our members want, when our members want. Ultimately, we're strong enough how our members want. And there's no fetters. Does that make sense? No. Um, How do you engage in collective bargaining? Uh, we don't. We depend on if they really want to deal, they, they can, you know, we, you know, this is part of the stuff that we teach, different examples from the history of labor. Okay. IWW took the same stance. Why bargain for a contract when you can just fight at any time? And they, they were very successful for a good chunk of the time, organizing exactly this membership. There's different examples in history. Okay. I know I'm a wobbly. You tell me All right. wobblies are successful oh, organized. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about the period in their zenith. All right. We are fast getting to the period of rebuttals. I know people over here have had multiple questions. And I know you still you haven't had one yet, so let's go to you and that'll be our last question. Yeah, I just wonder if uh out of the multiplicity of mayoral candidates here, there's a preferred one. Um, Anybody that you see it as, as an ally in your fight? No. As a policy, we do not endorse candidates. We have not seen a party that actually has our members' interests at heart. So our members are like, 
you know, forget about it. Okay, let's, uh, please, go ahead. Uh, if, if our members decided that they wanted to organize something like a candidate's night, um, something like that where candidates could come and speak, that would be a possibility. But again, our organization operates under membership direction. If they see that as something that is vital and necessary to do, we'll make it happen. But so far, I can tell you people we just talked to today on the canvas, when we were out there in the cold, were telling us that the real decision makers are about 12 people in this country that have multi-millions or billions of dollars. And that they feel, or many of our members feel, their vote doesn't matter. Okay. okay. Um, I would like to now, Andy, can you help me here real quick? Uh, we'd like to know how many people have rebuttals Count right here. Okay, can you count Andy for us, please? Okay. Looks like eight. Well, we'll go about uh, maybe four minutes apiece. Yeah, this will be other things. Andy will be counting for us. Let's thank our speakers. Thank you very much for having us. Well, let's get the first rebutter up there. Andy, please take over and uh, get our get our rebuttal started. Let's give him one more round of applause, please. You guys will get the last word. Okay, Andy, let's get let's get the thing started. Okay, and let's let's get started here. I'm sorry. We have to get into the rebuttal. Uh, for one thing, we're not getting the proper statistics. All right, let's give our speaker the proper attention he deserves. Go ahead, Sid. We're not getting the proper statistics on the un unemployment level. They tell you it's about 3%. And actually, what they don't tell you is far more important, and that is about 40% of the workforce has stopped looking for work. So it's a lot more than what they say, and, and it's affecting almost uh, 100 million people at this particular time. Now, one time, around um, 1960, the level of industrialization was about 25%. About four years ago, 2014, 2015, it was about 8.8% .8 that were in the industrial uh, sector of the workforce. So we don't have the industrial capacity that we used to. Another thing is, there's a lot of people, and she brought it out, that are working part-time, contingent labor is what they call it, and for instance, if they want somebody, they'll call them up on the phone, tell them to come over for this particular day and so, so and so much hours that they work, which isn't the full day. And there's a lot of people employed in that, in that sector. So the thing is that under the Roosevelt administration, he put out the New Deal and the reason he done it, and I brought this out before, because he thought there would be a revolution in the United States. Because as actually they said, there was about 25% unemployment, probably uh, maybe about 35% unemployment. And he realized if he didn't do something, you'd have a, he'd have a revolution on his hands and capitalism would be threatened. So he put forth these New Deal programs that put people to work, but it wasn't all people. And the unemployment level went down, according to them, about 17 to about 17 percent. But then what he called the economic royalists, or the capitalists and the bankers at that time, didn't like what he was doing because this will lead to socialism. So the only thing that really got us out of the Depression was World War II. We're in a very similar situation 
the economy is doing awful, and they don't tell people about it. They don't want people to get together and do anything, and to have a new deal like they had under Roosevelt. They're very much scared of that because they believe it'll lead to socialism. So in the short run, you might have a new deal if you put enough pressure on them, if you put a lot of heat under their behinds and make them do these things, but you need an awful lot of pressure, they might put in a new deal like we had before, and that's what uh, uh, Bernie Sanders was talking about. He talks about social democracy. It's really not, it's really not socialism what he's advocating. It's capitalism with a few reforms. So that must help us to a certain degree. People <coughs> should support it. But in the long run, you have to go to a different type of economy if you really want to get out of this thing. And the economy I'm talking about is what the producers do. Producers are the workers. They should control the means of production. And we would have a different type of society altogether. And I think that's what we should really aim for in the long run. Thanks. I'm Hal, and as far as, uh, there's a lot of things wrong, but you know, we have one thing that's really nice. It's called Lake Michigan. It's fresh water. All you have to do is go to the lake, get your water, put it through a two-foot pan filter, and you have your water. It's very nice. Now, I have a, a, a brief uh, ad that I'd like to put out to the universe. Uh, I think we need it now because we're in pretty bad shape. So it goes like this. One intelligent life form needed. Beautiful, temperate planet, ideal for life, enjoys weather, climate, suitable for a wide variety of diversity, life forms, long history of evolution, Six intelligent life form. Current residents endangering its existence. So we'll put it out there for the universe. We need to get someone else. Let me see what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jean. Uh, the first thing I want to say is I never heard of this organization, but maybe I don't know everything. Maybe that's why I'm here, uh, to learn something. Uh, I liked what I heard, and I liked what I saw. Uh, these folks are working from the bottom. Uh, there's an element, a strong element of democracy. Uh, they passed around a sheet so you could sign up. They passed around some material so when I get home, maybe I can read it. I can't read it here, but all of those things are good. Uh, I heard one of the speakers say something like, we were instrumental in getting. She didn't say, we got it all alone. They work with other people to get something done. This sounds like an example, and we heard about unions. The government, uh, generally speaking, our government is against unions. <coughs> it's against unions. Uh, with, union, with unions, there's also community organizing. And community organizing, actually, prob I'm not a historian of community organizing, but appears to have coming out of labor organizing. So labor and community organizing ought to go together. Uh, tell me when I got one minute left. Uh, Jane, uh, Jane Adams Senior Caucus, 501C43. And Jane Adams Seniors in Action. 501c4 are two examples of community or organizations 
that take action along these uh, lines of this organization. So you, uh, there are all kinds of organizations to join. And no, I won't be there next Saturday. I'll be at the Albany Park, North Park, Mayfair, Neighbors for Peace and Justice, working in another organization. But the idea of this organization, working from the bottom up, is good because, right, we got an oligarchy run to help a plutocracy. I'd like to see a democracy. Thank you. All right, next. I mostly know I'm an activist for social justice, so I thought I, uh, I thought I put in a lot of time and did a lot of good, but these guys put me to shame. I uh, really am uh, in awe of what they're doing. Uh, um, it's um, a deep struggle of um, capitalism as uh, the pendulum has swung so far to the rich uh, having control in our society and uh, the fight is on so many levels. Uh, uh, I just hope that uh, none of them get discouraged and that they keep up the good work. Uh, it, it seems a shame. Um, it occurred to me to look up um, again the uh, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, that goes back to 1948 uh, the United Nations and uh, somehow my cell phone had it up here and it's gone away but uh, um, it's uh, one of the uh, rights is to health care <laughs> and look at how what a struggle that's been in this country and and uh, and decent housing in which by extrapolation of course you could include um, you know, not having your electrical and especially your water shut off uh, and having to live with uh, getting buckets uh, like they do in Ethiopia or someplace. Um, so um, it seems, um, um, a, you know, a discouraging thing that we haven't come further, but um, at least we have um, several good people here that gave us a talk about um, um, what work they're doing and. Uh, and I'm, I'm, and I'm very proud and um, encouraged that uh, my friend uh, Jonathan is involved with this group. Okay. Thank you very much to Stacy, Angelia, and Trevor this evening. Um, another name for organizer is uh, one who reminds others of their power, one who reminds others of their energy, one who reminds others of their authenticity, one who reminds others of their autonomy, one who reminds of others of their creativity, one who reminds others of their beauty, and one who reminds others of their solidarity. And if you've ever uh, been at a fundraising event or a solidarity event, or a canvas or an outreach or a networking event which many of you have throughout the years with Jane Adams Senior Caucus and the Independent Living Movement and the Movement for Workers Rights uh, you know that you've never received a no ever from someone's soul we've received a lot of no's throughout the years from people's voices or people's body language or uh, how people don't really have a couple minutes to hear us out. Uh, but we've never got a no from people's soul, and that's what's kept me going throughout the years, learning from all of you, is my job is to help someone reconnect their deeds and their voice and their mind and their heart and their dreams to their soul. And that's all of our goals anyway, just on our spiritual life's past. That's not organizing that's the structure for everything so organizing is a wonderful healthy exercise in order to reconnect ourselves to our humanness uh, our uh, the fact that we're all earthlings we all share that one thing that we all love equally uh, because it's there for us uh, so that's what we do we remind others to keep all of those parts of our lives uh, consistently connected with the soul uh, it's a spiritual revolution. 
a constant solidarity bridge that strongly unites dreams and deeds. And that's not a trite or cliched or superficial sense uh, like status quo radio songs or pop music where everything's always free and always loved and always ad infinitum, you know, popular top 40 hit tunes, culture, uh, you know, everything's, you know, perfect. Uh, the true source of consciousness, the true source of character, the self-generated triumph of a genuinely free-minded, love-hearted, solidarity soul, we the people's global human family, is that effort to find liberation within ourselves and then join others for that liberation of the collective. Uh, many of you know my mom. She's a retired uh, nurse, uh, Linda Barton. She's a member of Midwest Workers Association too. And she's been to a Midwest Workers Association before where uh, it's hard to impress someone who was an uh, operating room nurse for 33 years who 18 of those years worked with a disability, multiple sclerosis. When she went there, she said she really liked how they kept things disciplined and diligent and all-inclusive and welcoming, especially to one of the most excluded populations in the world, the disability community. That's a very high bar. So when you go there and you see that genuine, we need your help, not just we're going to condescend condescendingly uh, express uh, paternalism, but we need your skills. Uh, it liberated her for a short amount of time that she was there. And like many of the grassroots organizations that mom was able uh, during her retirement and continues to be connected to through many grassroots movements, uh, it sustains families to know there is a light at the end of this ridiculous economic failure tunnel that's imposed on us unnaturally by corporate forces. If there was one thing I could change about this evening, I would have the speakers have broadcasted on public television and public radio channels to the entire uh, Chicagoland area. I think they uh, summarized very much uh, why people love past people, uh, popular people's struggles all over the world and why it's time to reconnect with the soul and do something that I often repeat to myself as a mantra and have talked about at college a lot and that's disobeying the dream limit. Uh, the ruling class propaganda often tells us you can't go any further than the late 60s, early 70s. We know because of the great work to end poverty by Midwest Workers Association, that's false. You can disobey the dream limit and go far beyond our wildest dreams to have a world of all, by all, for all. Hats off to Midwest Workers Association. Let's have a great 2019 in all our grassroots organizations. Good evening. Uh, when I was a kid, we had about six newspapers in Chicago. Uh, we had a morning newspaper, an afternoon newspaper, and an evening newspaper. In those days, a paper ranged from maybe five cents to ten cents. And the newspapers gave you stock market quotations for the afternoon. They gave you the daily closed stock market tables for the evening. Uh, but slowly, newspapers were lessened until we have only two newspapers. Uh, the Chicago Sun-Times and the Tribune. And each newspaper is way over a dollar. So uh, that is a proof that when you lessen competition, the price goes up. When we had uh, the CTA, which was not the Chicago Transit Authority, but it was the Chicago Transit Company, uh, they uh, were regulated, and they, would, they had to beg for the right to make uh, fare increases. 
the Chicago, Chicago wouldn't give it to them. But the minute that they got taken over by Chicago, the first thing they did was jack up the fares. So, once again, if you don't have competition, then you have higher prices. And uh, that's why with the electric company, the gas company, and the water company, there's no competition. They charge what they want. And uh, the price always goes higher, and it never goes lower. Incidentally, in a free market society, uh, like we once were, uh, a depression meant, meant that prices would go down, uh, rents would go down, costs would go down. So when they say in 29, when the bottom fell out, and you had bank presidents selling apples on the street for a nickel each, so that they could try to make some kind of money, we were still very much involved in a free market. And a depression brings back the idea of low prices. A uh, economic adversity is not all bad. It brings back a sense of reality. And when you don't have that, when you have the fix in place where the water company is independent and can charge what they want, the electric company and the gas company, they just go right on having the prices they have. When, in, in 2008, when the market went pretty bad, did you see any prices go down? Did McDonald's lower their prices? Did uh, Dunkin' Donuts lower their prices? Or did that other company, the uh, one that sells coffee, or it's Starbucks, they didn't lower their prices. They started to shut down a few places, but they didn't lower prices. No, because the, the prices of virtually everything were artificially held at one thing. And that's not truly a free market. That is representative of a contrived market. Incidentally, I noticed that when uh, the lady here that was speaking, when she wanted uh, uh, Trevor to agree with what she was saying, he would stand there and go like this. Oh, come on. And when she would say something she wanted him to say no to, he would go like this. Uh, and a few times he did things with his hands. What's the purpose of this? My, uh, why don't you shut up? No, I will not. No, you won't shut up because you won't give this the other ridiculous. person the respect that no, they need to be able to talk. You, you should just shut your mouth. No, I'm not. No, you won't because you're, be, because okay, you don't respect the college. What are you talking about? This He's the boss. The fact is, what I'm saying is, I, I thought it was very good because I never saw the strings, okay? Uh, usually, you know, Charlie McCarthy or one else, you'd pull a string and they'd do what they had to do. But it didn't go that way with this. He did exactly what she wanted him to do. For whatever good it did, I don't know. But I'm all for freedom and not this nonsense. That's a terrible thing to say. This is nuts. Freedom. He's completely nuts. I don't know how I can follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a shot. So, uh, uh, utilities. Utilities is a racket, isn't it? Um, I remember uh, reading about how the uh, gas company decided to uh, replace all the pipes and dump it on all the uh, Chicagoans, regardless of whether they could afford it or not. And uh, I get a gas bill now, and uh, guess what? If I don't use any gas at all, I get a $30 gas bill. Because that's just the price that they charge you for the pipes to get it there. That's before you start using gas. Now, there are a lot of people who can go, who can groan and still pay the bill. And there are a lot of people who just say, wow, this is putting me under. 
just one example, so many examples of corporations who are just nickel and diving people into homelessness. It, it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful. So um, I've done some construction, and for what it's worth, you can actually save a fair amount of money uh, by saving, uh, to do stuff to save energy. And uh, um, I'm not sure if uh, your organization is familiar with this, but uh, there are people in the uh, heating industry who can use uh, equipment to take a, th a thermal imaging of homes to see if there are major heat leaks during the summer. And it's, uh, you, you can just clearly see where there's heat escaping, and usually it's like through, this, through the roof and out windows because they're through uh, poor insulation. And those are things that you can deal with. There are some costs to it. You can, uh, uh, really good insulation in the attic can help a lot. Um, putting an extra layer, they sell plastic, or you can retrofit it to add a second layer to windows and really try to identify and stop uh, heat leaks. Um, I'm, that's not going to make a huge difference, but it could be significant enough if they have some problem homes. So that's one idea out there. Um, uh, electrical is uh, can be the same if, if somebody is using uh, a heater that's electrical. There are a lot of people out there who kind of are desperate and they use electrical heaters. They're not very efficient, unfortunately. And then um, water is, uh, I, I heard a lot of people saying that we're just so close to the lake. It's right there. And um, I can tell you as uh, somebody who's done a lot of camping, who's had to actually carry water with me that I've had to use. Water is heavy. The idea of somebody walking down to Lake Michigan with a couple of uh, containers or a wheelbarrow or whatever and trying to get their supply of water is not practical. It's not at all. Uh, a, a standard new toilet, you flush it, there goes three gallons. Okay, and if, you, if you're uh, in an old neighborhood, you might have an older style toilet that's a five gallons for every flush. So that's a big problem. Um, that uses a lot of water, just the flushing mechanism. So if there's a strategy to deal with that, um, I'm going to offer one. Crazy, crazy idea. Uh, but this is not something that's new. They've written books on this. Uh, everybody's heard about uh, composting. So they take uh, garbage, they take uh, grass clippings, leaves, and they compost it. What happens, they put it in a bin, and then they, after a while, what happens is it starts uh, uh, to decomposition. That creates heat, and it starts to break down, and eventually, over a two or three year period, that actually turns into soil. And uh, it is very nutritious, and uh, people use it to uh, uh, fertilize their lawns or their gardens but where there are some areas where they're actually doing it with human waste. Now I know this sounds, if you've heard this before, this sounds really crazy and really gross, but they've written about this, there's people who've done studies on it, and they've implemented this in uh, third world countries, and it works. They literally have ways of composting human waste. Um, you'll see it a lot of, uh, on, on YouTube, you'll see a lot of people talking about this. It's, um, it's a great way to save money. It actually does break down in the same way as uh, compost for garbage or grass clippings, and after two, three years, it's soil. Very nutritious, uh, nutrient-rich soil. So um, the only problem is it's in municipalities, if they find out that you're doing this, to save water, they'll shut you down because it's not approved plumbing. So that's not approved way of dealing with waste. So uh, just throwing out ideas there. I really um, admire what you're doing, and best of luck to you. All right. Well, thank you, three folks, for coming out. Thanks. I enjoyed the program. Thank you for your social work. I picked up a degree in it over the years. Uh, three things I'm going to talk about here is organizing, being a labor organizer for many, many years, decades. Um, yeah, I, I, I see the nomenclature and the activities of organizing labor, but then 
it didn't culminate in a, an organization. You might want to maybe strengthen your ties in that regard, but that's up to the org MWA uh, to look into. The other thing is I've been lobbyist and do it every day, my, every day of the week. Um, I used, took an apolitical position, which I don't perceive is productive. I wouldn't advise that. There are decisions made in the political arena. And the other thing is a lot of people in distressed situations, and I don't want to get into too many generalizations, but you've got people looking to Trump as being offering some sort of solution to their economic difficulties. And if you don't fill that void, there is social legislation. And the new Congress is coming up. There's no, none of the laws from the old one are kept from the old one. Uh, and there's some very good legislation. I still remember they come up with themes for Congress. Uh, one, one theme for like the 114th Congress was watch out for the little guy. So there is social legislation, yeah, to see what what uh, is on the agenda, and you might want to consider that, you know. Um, I don't know if you want to consume yourself. I know a lot of your organizations usually then point somebody, some kind of political director, and they do all this stuff by themselves. That's usually what it amounts to. But, um, I mean, being a lobbyist myself, that's what I look forward to first. Now the last thing I've heard tonight is some complete and utter total nonsense that you're going to turn the utilities of this city over to the private sector and that free enterprise is going to bring you uh, better, better regulations, administration of utilities, and cheaper prices. A number of us put together an organization that still exists called the uh, Privatization Watch Illinois. The very last thing you want to do is sell the infrastructure such as electricity, water, and gas over to the private sector. It's been an absolute and total disaster, whichever wherever it has taken place. You can see the disaster that took place regarding the parking meters. We're literally at ground zero. Now some people somehow, even though they're, 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 they're living in the number one city against privatization of, of public entities, still have not, don't wake up, open their eyes and say, well, maybe competitive free enterprise isn't that wonderful. Guess what? It costs the people enormous amounts of money. They get less service if they get service at all. It's a very much the last thing you want to do. Now, I've lived in the city and I can figure that out because I see it all the time. I hear the complaints. But nevertheless, the people are still advocating it. The last thing you want to do is engage in privatization of, of these uh, services. You think, you think they're arbitrary and capricious now, and you did tell a very accurate story about at the hearings. But if they were private companies at all, I assure you, you would get no hearing whatsoever. Absolutely none. Now the government comes in and tries to regulate these industries. Uh, that's what I mean. You you have to, whether we like it or not, we are in we are live in a political arena. And there you have the major thing is not what you do or how you do it or anything like that, but who's the deciding official and who can grant the remedy you seek? That's what you focus on. I mean, if you have a grievance or a gripe and you want some, a problem corrected, identify who can grant the remedy you seek. And it doesn't do any good to talk to anybody else, like talking to you guys. <laughs> it's a waste of time. <laughs> then leave and get out of here. But no, I'm serious. Then leave and get out of Whatever here. Whatever it is on the issue is, we'll figure out who it is. And... All right, thank you very much. Thanks again. Thanks for the calendar. Sent by MWA down at South Oaks. All right. You're welcome to come to my house, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll buy you a cup of coffee, let you pet my cat.
<laughs> for three dollars. <laughs> okay. Good evening. All right, Shirley, let's give our next speaker a chance. Good evening. My name is Linda American. I want to say Linda American. Advocate. I live in Cook County. My question is, I thought I would at the end here. What are the major accomplishments of MWA? You want to say yes, would you answer that? Yes, please. Yeah. I mean, stopping like over $1.5 billion dollars worth of collective uh, utility rate hikes and things like that, reconnecting <laughs> dozens of members each and every season, you know, either if they've already been shut off, stopping the shut offs, getting people who haven't seen a dentist, a doctor, an optometrist to go and see those uh, kinds of professionals completely free of charge to people who are uninsured. And the biggest benefit of all, we like to say to our members, is the strength of organization, having a place where they can voice their concerns. We have a workers' benefit council for our members that meets weekly, where the first agenda item is always wages and working conditions. Members bring forward their concerns and campaigns get started out of it, like one we're formulating right now to start a petition drive to stop all water shutoffs, lower the rates and make reasonable payment plans like the state itself has mandated it's done. So the accomplishments are only going to keep going. Great, thank you. Okay. Your chance to get a statement is also up there if you want to say anything. I mean, you know, if you want to say your piece, you got about three or four minutes. I wrote a poem today. Can I say that? What? Go. I wrote a poem today. Go ahead. Please, go ahead. Yes, I was inspired. Words of glory. Praise the Lord above. He gives us eternal love. For every one story, let him have the glory of saving and healing for all we are feeling is gratitude in life delivered for, from our strife. In life, we were needing something with meaning. Now we have purpose with everlasting surplus of dreams being captured and thoughts of the rapture. Stay, stop, look, and listen. Our kingdom will listen right here on earth as it is in heaven. World without end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. It's sort of <laughs> Something happened recently in Scandinavia that may just help us out of this debacle with utility problems, the high cost of fossil fuels, the high cost of wind and solar the high cost of everything going in there. And what was that? For the first time in almost 40 years, they started a molten salt nuclear reactor. <laughs> and what happened is, is that these types of reactors are safe and with widespread deployment, we could get off oil, we could have an abundance of power that would like they had said in the 50s, almost too cheap to meter. I don't say this out of, the, out of being crazy, but if you may think me mad, so be it. Yeah. I honestly, firmly believe that a lot of our problems in the society today is due to the expense of, you know, utilities and the large costs of corporate welfare. I, I just, and I have also seen on the other side the benefits that capitalism has brought and the quick and fast getting rid of problems in society that a good job done through small business can generate. As usual, Charlie, you're dead wrong. Because the thing is, even in like a lot of these countries where they do have sweatshops, they eventually progress out of it and get decent paying work. I will give you the example of Singapore. I will give you the example of England. I will give you the example of America and what it did after the Civil War and up through today. Now, we've been through this before. In the early teens around our country, we had a similar type of debacle. As a matter of fact, it got so bad that they actually had a bombing on Wall Street. 
at one of the big banks in uh, 1920, I think it was 1921 or 22, and it resulted in a lot of the banks and reforms being done. What it took was a lot of antitrust laws, unionization, and some companies just having so much trouble with worker turnover that they had to raise the wages to get people in. I'm referring to Henry Ford and his president and setting wages that he had to keep his uh, assembly line workers involved. Worse than the and the other thing that you have to realize is that, yes, there's a definite need for union power. There's a definite need for organizations like this. But what I really feel is the death nail to what capitalism is, is the welfare we give out to our large corporations, <coughs> the handouts and the special favors. As a matter of fact, many people like to go back to the uh, premise of Adam Smith and quote him, you know, for saying the glories of capitalism. But if you look at him carefully in his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, he strongly advocates no corporate welfare. And at the time he was around, he had a good example called the East India Tea Company. They had their own private army, they had their own private ships, they had a monopoly on the tea company. The directors of the corporation benefited immensely, the workers were still not paid that much, but they had a virtual monopoly from the crown and no competition. So in a lot of places, what we have today is not capitalism, but what Smith railed against, which is called mercantilism, where a lot of the larger companies got special favors from the government, or as we'd like to say, welfare for the rich. And if you really look at the Trump tax bill, that's a lot of what happened, was welfare for the larger companies and corporations. I don't like, you know, people saying, oh, it's all capitalism's fault, because it really isn't. What's at fault is a lot of the special benefits that a lot of these corporations and the tax write-offs and the pending favorable legislation that comes to them. They're powerful, but as we said, we can fight this stuff. You need to realize that sometimes, uh, you know, real estate investors like Trump, for example, can defray a lot of their expenses forward on, on a tax bill. But anyway, I've said enough, and I think myself, in summary, you still need to fight. You still need to get rid of the corporate tax loopholes and, and other things, and perhaps maybe take a reconsideration of looking at safe nuclear power. Yeah. This makes capitalism and gives it a little Oh, that's right, Charlie. That's right. Nuts. A little crazy. Nuts. My name is Andy Anderson. I'm, I'm from the uh, Northwest Information Service in Palatine. My brother and I run an information service summarizing books on news that is blacked out in the United States. I'll be giving a talk on that uh, February on the schedule here. What's the date going to be? February 16th. I forgot I'll be out of town on January 12th. At any rate, uh, I agree with Tim. Uh, something happened in one of the Scandinavian countries uh, a couple months ago and went viral. Uh, for those of you that believe in reincarnation, it's very possible that Martin Luther King was reincarnated into the body of a young Swedish girl. She sounds like a young Martin Luther King. And she created a sensation, one person at a time. She got depressed at 9, 10, 11 years old studying the climate, climate change. She wondered why adults weren't doing anything. And she's one of the most articulate climate activists in the world now at the age of 15. But what set her apart? Her name is Greta Thunberg, T-H-U-N-B-E-R-G. Just do a Google search. Uh, if you can't remember the name Greta Thunberg, do just Google Swedish girl walks uh, protest climate from school. School walk out in Sweden. She woke up one day uh, just before her 15th birthday somewhere this last year and said, what am I doing in school if I got no future? What am I doing in school if I have no future because of climate change? She's looking at the reports, the summary of 15,000 scientists that just published their report, the latest annual update that said we got less than 12 years. 2030, if we're not half off of fossil fuel by 2030, it's over. So what all of these different groups uh, for justice, climate justice, 
they're talking about recreating a, a, a civilization where there's not this massive inequality that our speakers were talking about tonight. So in order to solve the climate crisis, we have to address the fact that a handful of billionaires are killing the planet for in their drive for profits. So, uh, as she put it, uh, she gave a talk, a TED talk, uh, to a bunch of people at the uh, United Nations meeting. There's all kinds of videos on the internet now that have gone viral in the last two or three weeks about uh, the school strike out. Now there's more than 20,000 students taking one day off a week just telling their teachers or whatever, I'm out of here, I'm going to go protest the climate for a day, I'll be back when I get back. Can you imagine telling your teachers that 20 years ago? But this is where we are. And uh, other groups are saying people need to take a time out. People need to take a time out from what they're doing like we did in 1941. The industry took a time out. They stopped making cars. They stopped making the most appliances that were luxuries. And they made billions of tons of everything needed to solve the problem for four years. That's what needs to be done now. People, uh, all these different issues people are working on can be solved very, very fast if we join forces with the people that are promoting a sane green future where the oil companies and the billionaires that own the media are not allowed to continue to pollute the environment, the waterways, the airwaves, with the airwaves especially, with the insane mental sewage that is daily flowing out of our White House. Nobody alive has ever seen anything like the Trump administration. And other groups are beginning to say, we have language matters. Donald Trump is not the president of the United States. Donald Trump is a corporate criminal con man, been money laundering all yes, kinds is. of crimes over the last 20, 25 years. He's masquerading as our president. We have no president. He doesn't do any presidential duties. Rarely a day goes by when he doesn't totally disgrace the office four or five times throughout the day through his pronouncements. We have to get real here and do what Greta said. She said uh, in her speech, she says, we've had 30 years of people giving inspirational, hopeful speeches. What we need now is action. He said, we don't need more studies about what to do about climate. All the, all the problems have been solved. What we need now is to take the equipment to solve these problems and go do it. That means get up, go out of school for a day or two and say, what the hell am I doing in school if I got no future? I'm taking a time out now and then maybe I'll get back to school in two or three years. If somebody's thinking about college, put it on hold for two or three years. Because if we don't solve the climate problem, college degree isn't going to do you any good in 10 years. And you talk about Lake Michigan water. We were talking about Lake Michigan water tonight. Well, where do you think that uh, 50 million refugees from Florida, Houston, the coast, when those cities are flooded from the hurricanes, you think, you think they're not going to be coming north looking at our water and land and everything else? This is everybody's problem. Well, just build a wall. So, so uh, for those of you that don't know yet, the most hopeful site that I know of that posts articles every day of people doing good things, solving problems like what our speakers talked about tonight, is Common Dreams. CommonDreams.org. That's, that's the best one I know of. And running a close second is a thing called Truthout. Truthout.org. It's run by a retired school teacher, Professor uh, William Rivers Pitt. Uh, and the writing on both of those sites, they're both reader reported, no advertising. But Common Dreams posts little pictures of, it's like a breaking news 24 hour cycle, like CNN, but it's in print on the internet. So, uh, you know, also today, there's an article on Common Dreams, 10 good things, 10 good reasons for hope coming out of 2018. So, uh, you know, the news media, you can't learn anything really of what's happening by watching our mainstream news or reading like the New newspapers. Like New York Times, I shouldn't read that. Well, they won't tell you what's really happening on a lot of things. New York Times let us into the war in Iraq. They, they, they were a cheerleader for it. So, anyway, uh, we're getting to the point where the heckling is starting again, so let's give our speakers a hand. Our speakers can come up for the last word. Yes. Woo! I gotta cancel my New York Times.
Yeah, it wouldn't be a bad idea, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, we, Log on to Common Dreams. Some, so start some, looking at the websites rather than New York internet. Times. Get the truth from the internet. We'd just like to say thank you so much. We've really appreciated um, our time here and your interest, and I hope we will see each and every one of you at some point in the coming winter survival campaign. You know, definitely give us a call. We're open every day, nine to nine. For our web, for our web-based audience, where the YouTube channel's going on. Do you have a website or do you have a... We don't actually, but we are open every day. You can call us uh, at any time. Uh, we are, we are there. What would be your phone number? 773-285-0499. It's also on all your newspapers. Every newspaper has it on there. 773-285-0485. Give us a call. We're open 9 to 9. Um, and tell them you saw us at the Collins Complex. What's the other one? It's on the newsletter? It's on your newsletter on the back. Yeah, you're good. If you got the newsletter, you're golden. What you can do is then close us out and adjourn us. Uh, thank you, everybody. I guess this meeting is closed and adjourned, and I hope you all have a wonderful all right. evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, see you next week. Okay.